Hello and welcome to the Flights of Fancy podcast, the podcast where we talk about combat aviation and military aircraft. Today's episode is going to be about the Bristol Blenheim, or Blenheim. I've never really figured out exactly how to pronounce it. However, that is still our subject for today. Uh, I'm Mr. O, as with as always with me is Mr. X. Hey. We've got uh, an interesting uh, one for you. Um, if only because, in my mind, this is a very popular aircraft, but one that doesn't really get talked much um, with regards to its development. Um, there's a lot of them out there, a lot of them, well, not a lot anymore, but there were a lot of out of them, uh, out there of them, um, producing large numbers, but there's always that sort of preconceived notion about which one it is and where exactly it went in terms of um, production, how it was used, and so on. So uh, without further ado, um, we're just going to jump right into this. Uh, first things first, uh, I want to point out that um, the Bristol company itself, um, while I don't have a lot of information on it, I just don't have any that many books on it, um, should not be confused with uh, another Bristol company. So the first being Bristol Aerospace is not the same as the Bristol Aeroplane Company. Um, sometimes that is referred more as BAC or BAC uh, than um, the full name. Now, uh, the reason why this is important to note is because Bristol Aerospace is still technically a company. Um, it's a it's, it was a subsidiary under the Bristol Aeroplane Company, um, but was uh, after that company um, went bust. Uh, the that division was bought out by another company and exists under uh, a new corporate umbrella. Um, now, the BAC was a very important um, producer for uh, the British uh, military. Um, not only was the uh, the company, like many others that were at the forefront um, of development of aircraft back in the early 1900s, um, they managed to pick up a few uh, good contracts that helped them ex uh, essentially expand uh, and grow into the powerhouses that um, other companies like the Ferry Company, uh, the Short Brothers Company, and etc. Um, now, a short history of the Bristol Company uh, essentially boils down to it being founded by one Sir George White. Uh, sadly, I don't know any photos of them. Um, and if they're, if they are, I, I don't think I've been able to uh, vet them at all. Now, uh, he founded the company in 1910, um, and the company itself had some notable successes, namely the Bristol Scout, which was a plane that was built, uh, designed and built in 1914, and uh, subsequently the Bristol F2 Fighter in 1916, um, both of these selling over 350 and 5,300 examples, respectively. Now this is important to note because um, much like the ferry company, uh, having such large orders right off the bat allows you to essentially guarantee a sort of safety for uh, the company. Now, um, the second member on this PowerPoint uh, being Lord Rothermere, or Rothermeyer, is uh, essentially the catalyst to today's story. Um, he was a, a very wealthy gentleman. Um, he uh, essentially owned the Daily Mail, I believe it was, and uh, in the 1930s had a desire to uh, fund or design slash build a fast transport aircraft, um, one that could be used for himself and uh, any sort of co-workers, well, more specifically aides, but um, people to use with him in order for him to accomplish his duties as the owner of such a, a prevalent company. Um, this can essentially be boiled down to or seen as uh, a comparison or an equivalent to modern day private jets. Um, we always know about first class transportation, um, private jets being used to transport CEOs and other high ranking officials. Um, to and from places, and that was the exact same sort of desire that Lord Rothermere had. Now, um, he found himself uh, in good company with the Bristol Company, 
um, as they had essentially uh, decided to pitch in and design um, what would eventually become the Bristol Blenheim. Now, before we can get that to that specifically, um, there's two things that need to be pointed out. Uh, the first is that the design did not actually start out as a military aircraft. Um, it's a, it was supposed to be a fast transport aircraft, um, to which it, it was. Um, and the designer for it, Mr. Uh, or Captain Frank Soder uh, Barnwell, was essentially the uh, main person behind the design. Now, um, unfortunately, I can't really find too much else on Mr. Barnwell. Uh, he had the same sort of history as a lot of other uh, aircraft um, designers back in the day. Um, he works with family in order to uh, further his uh, knowledge and design ability and so on um, by, uh, by building his own aircraft. Um, he then joins the uh, Bristol Aeroplane Company in 1911. 1914, as war breaks out, he decides to join the Royal Flying Corps. Um, in 1915, it's not specifically stated, but either he decides or he is forced out of the military in order to provide his expertise, his knowledge to the company uh, or to a company in order for them to then subsequently build better aircraft so that the RFC has better um, examples to use and so on so forth. Now, um, the Bristol F-2 fighter, the, uh, the example, the aircraft that had over 5,300 examples built, was one that was prim uh, primarily designed by Mr. Barnwell himself. So you can kind of see how um, that sort of uh, feedback loop on getting experience with the designer, going back to a company, and then being able to successfully produce uh, a really good design engenders itself. Um, now, unfortunately for the Bristol Aeroplane Company and uh, Mr. Barnwell himself, um, unfortunately he died in 1938 uh, while flying a personal aircraft. Um, I think the details are that he was flying an aircraft of his own design, and there was some sort of uh, issue with the controls um, and so on. Um, on uh, the bottom of the page here, this is basically uh, the Bristol Aeroplane Company's um, production facility at the time. Um, not quite as large as, um, as some American manufacturing centers, um, but the one thing to keep in mind is that uh, the UK had a sort of plan in place so that they would have what they called shadow uh, factories or shadow production. And the entire idea behind this was that um, if the BAC was somehow taken out, um, if that manufacturing center was somehow taken out, you then have, at the very least, a well, one or more subsequent groups that can produce these aircraft that you need. So while the Bristol Aircraft Company itself may have not occupied a large land space um, or been able to churn out, you know, uh, tens or twenties of thousands of aircraft themselves, um, it did help other British corporations um, or companies to um, help produce and make up those numbers. Um, now, the uh, Bristol Type 142, uh, as it was originally called, um, earned itself the moniker Britain First, and this was given to it by uh, Mr. Uh, or Lord Rothermere himself. The um, aircraft proved to be quite a shock to uh, the military as well as the public, because um, while its first flight was uh, in 1935, um, the real big shocking thing for the public, and again the military, was that it was much faster than uh, the then newest design currently going um, into the, the hands of fighter squadrons uh, within the UK, namely the Gloucester Gladiator. There was, it was also compared to uh, other uh, aircraft such as the Hawker Freery and so on. Um, but the main thing, the main takeaway really is that um, it flew much faster than uh, its um, any fighter at, of the time it was capable of. Now, this is uh, accomplished for, or 
because mainly of two different things. Um, the first is a biplane aircraft has an extra wing, which produces a lot of lift, but also adds to a lot of drag. Um, the other main consideration is that the uh, Bristol Type 142 has two engines and is designed to be specifically fast. Yes, it can transport people, but people aren't necessarily as heavy as, say, bombs, weapons, munitions, extra fuel, protection, etc. Um, and uh, sadly, there's no, there doesn't seem to be a consensus on to, uh, to exactly how fast the Type 142 could go. So um, you, you have to take the 450 to 500 kilometers an hour, um, essentially a difference of uh, 43 to uh, 93 kilometers faster than its closest competitor. Um, this also causes another problem within uh, the, the UK and other nations' air forces. Uh, the big issue being that the, um, the prevailing thought in uh, the 1930s, because of aircraft such as uh, the Type 142, was that the bomber would always get through. And the biggest reference that people made was um, in part due to this comparison, um, but you see it in, in a couple others as well. Um, in Russia, you have aircraft like the DB-3 that's, that outperforms aircraft uh, like the, um, the I-15, which is another biplane. Um, you have issues or issues uh, in terms of um, in Southeast Asia and Japan, you have aircraft uh, like the Ki-21 or um, others of that time that can beat biplanes. And so because um, fighter design hadn't reached that modern level, you have the, the theory grows and grows and grows that the bombers are always going to get through and you have a very narrow window to ever catch them. Um, the, in the UK specifically, you can see how that affected fighter design in that the uh, next two major um, uh, fighter aircraft that, the, that they adopt, um, the first being the Hurricane and the second being the Supermarine Spitfire, both of those have a large amount of forward firing guns. And that's not necessarily because um, a lot of firepower is good, it is, but one of the main considerations is that you can only intercept the bomber force for maybe one or two engagements and then the bomber speeds away. So for the fighter to capitalize on, on such, uh, such an opportunity, they have to have a lot of forward firing machine guns in order to, and even if they don't have a lot of ammo, that's not the point. The point is, is that you're, you're not looking for longevity of combat. You're looking for, um, how much power you can put out in a very short amount of time. So it causes a lot of controversy, but l luckily for uh, the Bristol company, what it does is it means that the UK says, you know what, you have a very fast aircraft. It can transport people, sure. But what if we decided that we would have a small change? We'll decide to add, um, we'll give you the capacity to drop bombs will decide that uh, you need to have some armor protection and so on and so forth. And um, in that same year, 1935, uh, in the summer, the, mil the air ministry itself uh, awards a contract for 150 aircraft to go with specification 2835. Now, um, one of the few things that uh, is a, a major difference in... Um, in looking at the Type 142 and the 142 M, um, which is the M standing for militarized rather than modification, um, you have the addition of a bomb bay. You have the rear turret that we can see. Um, you have a, a navigator in the nose to aid with dropping bombs. But one of the more uh, significant changes um, that we can see is when we look at the the Type 142. We can see that the wing is rather low to the body. Uh, it's what, what they usually call a low wing. Um, uh, I'm blanking on the name here, but it's a like a low wing design. Whereas in 
Uh, this view, we can see that the wing is actually now in a mid-wing design. And the entire reason for this, um, as, uh, as mentioned in, in manuals and, and other statements, is for the inclusion of a bomb bay. So if you, uh, you need to have this bomb bay and you need to have the wings higher so that they can create that space because you have to have the, the bomb bay doors open up, which causes issues and, and design problems. And for them, the easiest way was to uh, lift the wings. Now, the first uh, militarized prototype was um, was flown on 1936 on June 25th, and, and units began receiving uh, the same types uh, starting in March 1937. Four months later, the Air Ministry purchased a further 434 airframes, and the type was eventually named the Blenheim Mark I. Um, it's an all-metal construction aircraft, so it saves um, it saves a lot on weight. Um, it's a lot more rigid than than uh, having a wooden design. But the one caveat is that, uh, like other aircraft in the UK and elsewhere in the world. Um, you have uh, parts like the rudder, uh, the um, the ailerons, and I believe the uh, elevators. So, elevators. Uh, those are all still fabric covered. Um, I always, I, I'm trying to think of the exact reason as to why they they left the control surfaces. Um, fabric covered, but it's it's not coming to me, so apologies there. It's not an uncommon choice. I just don't remember why off the top of my head. I, I want to say it's to, um, because you don't need metal specifically in the construction, because it's not a, um, it's an important piece, but it's not a structural piece, you can get yeah. away with using fabric. Yeah, there might also be some interesting damping properties with the flexibility of the material, but I don't know oh, at all. Gotcha. Um, so the design initially uses the Bristol Mercury 8. Uh, these engines are rated at 840 horsepower. There's a crew of three. So you have a, a pilot in the cockpit, you have a navigator in the nose, and you have a, a gunner in the rear turret. Now, interestingly, um, the Bombay can only carry a maximum of a thousand pounds, which is why the Blenheim earns the moniker of a light bomber. Um, it, there isn't uh, usually the definition between a light and a medium bomber um, relies more on uh, bomb carrying capacity versus a medium bomber compared to a heavy bomber, where the difference is more specifically uh, the number of engines being two to four, respectively. Um, the four engines does usually mean a lot of bombs or a True. lot of fuel or both and big amounts of guns. True. And the Blenheim's engines aren't that powerful. No, which is why it's... it's um, the fact that it still gets a lot of speed out of it really means that like that's why it has such a low bomb capacity is because they couldn't they couldn't afford to put more into uh, the design um a slight side note to the moniker of light versus medium bomber um there is one country notably that trips up a lot uh in in those classifications that being the japanese um, for whatever reason, the Japanese tended to label um, what other countries would call light and medium bombers, or even just medium bombers, as heavy bombers. Um, and I can't really, I, off the top of my head, I think it's more because of um, they had such a difference between payloads that uh, they never really had effective payloads, basically. So... Um, whenever you, you reached above, say, like 800 pounds or, or um, 800 kilos, that's when, like, it's a heavy bomber regardless of if it's got four engines or not. Um, which is why, like, you can't... the Japan's the only one that you can't rely on, on um, what they state as a heavy bomber versus other countries. Um, because everybody looks at, say, a TB3 even has, you know, four engines. 
Um, uh, B-17 is far and away different from just about every uh, Japanese bomber um, of the day. Um, now, getting back to the, the Blenheim, um, the Mark I had a pretty steady pro um, uh, production, having over 1,134 uh, production or examples built. Um, and uh, these weren't solely built by Bristol. You had other companies that would quote unquote help out or um, produce on license. So they're still being paid by the government to produce a, an example or a model that isn't technically their own. Um, Roots, I don't know anything about offhand, um, but Avro was a particularly um, big name in certain areas of the world, Hello Canada, um, and uh, we'll likely get to them uh, in the future. Now, um, the first official public appearance um, takes place in 1937 for the actual Blenheim, so not the Britain first, but the, the Blenheim itself. Um, and uh, it became very popular as a design. Um, the military really liked it. Um, there, nobody really had many issues with it. So hey, they set up. They immediately set up two production lines, um, and that's where you have uh, the uh, additional companies uh, helping out. Um, the uh, Blenheim, as mentioned here, has a couple of quirks to it, which is. Um, strange in a way it's very atypical i guess it would would be the way to put it um one of the closer comparisons i can make would be with uh, again the uh, the japanese in this case the mitsubishi g3m nell now the data i found is just offhand it's very quick uh, so i don't have um uh, earlier model data um with me right now but you we can see that they're kind of similar the the g3m has more crew um it's a much larger aircraft and it kind of this is kind of why like the japanese would sometimes more call this a, a heavy bomber um because it's got so many extra turrets and, and so on whereas the blenheim is uh, much smaller by comparison even just looking at the length and wingspan it's it's crazy to think that one has 26 feet less um in terms of uh in terms of that width uh, available to it uh, but that also comes at a cost, namely the range is, is far decreased, um, the speed, um, one has a higher speed just because it's a later model, so don't take that too much into account. But it's still important to note um, such differences, even with, uh, you know, if they have uh, bomb loads and, and such. Now, uh, one thing to also point out, uh, and is a quirk of the Blenheim as a whole, and only one or two variants ever got rid of this. Um, but the Blenheim, which I, I should probably just do red, um, the Blenheim always had a machine gun in the port wing. Um, this was seen as important or necessary for some reason. Um, I've never really figured it out myself, um, but the port gun was controlled by the pilot. So uh, we'll see it in later images, it'll be much clearer, but the pilot always has a, a bead and post uh, aim sight in front of them. And it's it's basically centered, I, I don't know if there's a specific offset uh, in terms of uh, distance um, that it's zeroed at, but it's a constant distance. You can't really use it for fighter tactics. It's more, um, I guess, harassment, or if you're attacking a boat or something, but otherwise you're better off just using bombs and whatnot. Um, it might seem also weird uh, just looking at it offhand, but we can see that there seem appear to be some holes in the fuselage. Uh, these are specific hand and foot holds that crew would use in order to get on top of the plane and use uh, this um, entry point. So the Blenheim, how it works is that the, um, they have sliding windows on the top. So this entire section um, essentially goes back and then the pilot and uh, navigator go in here. Whereas uh, if I've understood the designs properly, the gunner goes in through a hatch at the back. Now, the, um, the design of the Blenheim, because it was considered fast, um, which it 
technically was at the time it was being uh, it was first introduced. Um, oh, it was like compare it to the uh, contemporary American B eighteen Bolo, and it's a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Not as heavy. It's not that as also heavily armed, but speaking of the um, the Americans, that was also another um, big um, selling point was that the Britain first was actually supposed to be a competitor to the Douglas DC-1. And uh, sadly, I just don't have enough time to really bring out all these comparisons and everything. But um, I believe that the Blenheim or the Britain First would have would have been much faster than the DC-1. Um, the DC-1 itself was discontinued, I think, after one prototype. Um, but that is more because Douglas hit it off with uh, later designs, namely the, the Douglas DC-3. Um, so getting back to the uh, Mark I, because it was seen as a very fast aircraft, the Air Ministry decided that they should try it and basically change it into uh, a fighter aircraft. Um, they don't have too many. Production was lagging behind with Hurricanes and Spitfires. And you know what? While the, the Hurricane and Spitfire are good, nobody's going to argue that they, that they aren't, they do have problems with uh, range. So the what be, what better way to get yourself a long range fighter by just modifying an existing bomber design that you have that already has space and you're already producing it at large numbers. So what they do is they end up developing uh, conversion packs and these packs are essentially just like bolted on slight modifications to uh, some of the features of the aircraft. And Bob's your uncle, you've now got a, a long range fighter. Now, the, one of the bigger differences is the addition of a ventral gun pack. The ventral gun pack itself is uh, four 303 machine guns. Um, the British typically only ever used 303, uh, with the one exception being, um, I don't even think they use 30 cows. I think they jump straight to 50 cows when those become available. Um, so they use a ventral pack. The ventral pack itself, the way that it's bolted on, blocks the bomb bay because you can't open the bomb bay uh, with the pack installed. Now, the other important thing is that um, being a fighter aircraft, they quickly learn that daytime fighting is not a specialty of the Blenheim. Um, yes, it's fast and yes, it goes far. But by the time of 1934 and 1940, you're coming up against the BF-109 and BF-110s. And it's not exactly maneuverable enough, nor fast enough, to get out of the grips of either of those uh, enemy aircraft. And so, after losses, they eventually decide to shift it over to a, a night fighting capacity. Um, because of how prolific the Blenheim was, and how popular it was, um, the Blenheim actually ends up taking a lot of firsts, so to speak, um, within the um, the Royal Air Force. Uh, it's the first to conduct um, bombing duties against Germany. Uh, it's the first to attack shipping in, uh, I believe, the Channel. It's one of the first uh, UK aircraft to adopt uh, air interception radar and so on and so forth. Um, so for when it comes to the, uh, the night fighter variant, um, the British tended to use one or two major patterns in terms of camouflage. Typically, you'll see um, British aircraft in complete black, uh, although there are types. Um, you see this more on Spitfires and Hurricanes, where one wing would be completely black, as we see on this one, whereas the opposite wing would be completely white. I've never truly figured out why exactly that design uh, decision was made, but uh, that's basically just how it goes top and bottom of the wing or just the underside underside is probably for friendly recognition for grand observers yeah it makes sense that way um the uh the other thing to note about the the um night interceptors is that much like we've seen in other examples uh the blenheim uses a radar so it has uh, an antenna at the nose but it also uses uh, Yagi uh, radar um, antenna on the wings. There's also a set that's on top as well, uh, but you can't really see it on this image. 
Uh, and the other thing that um, gets mentioned is there's usually also a transceiver that's somewhere uh, on, uh, on the engine uh, near the cowling. Um, I forget the exact positioning and uh, honestly, uh, I forget if I've ever seen a single uh, image of it. Um, and we can see how uh, the gun pack also basically extends out the bottom of the aircraft. Um, when it comes to the, um, the bomber version while it was still in use, uh, especially in secondary fronts, so you'll see the Blenheim in uh, Southeast Asia, you'll see it in the Middle East. Um, one, of the, in, one of the interesting things um, that they did for the Blenheim in the Middle East was having, uh, essentially what they did is they removed the, the Bombay doors. Um, now, the only book I have that mentions this outright is um, a uh, uh, the Blenheims in Action, which is a Squadron Signal publication. I think it's number 88, which, uh, anyways, um, there's no mention as to why specifically they did it. But it's important to note that um, when it comes to the, the bombs, if they were, depending on how they were loaded, um, they had it so that a, um, and this is more typical of, of bombing in general or bombers in general, um, but for a design like this, you have the capacity of looking down into the bomb bay from, say, the cockpit, or at least a little bit further behind the cockpit. And so you can, um, you have an easier time of, of loading bombs rather than uh, in other cases where uh, you might just load up an entire assembly uh, into the into the plane uh, in one go. Now, um, one of the other attempts that they had done was uh, the Bristol Blenheim PR or photo reconnaissance model. Very little is known about these, um, if only because very little was ever accomplished with them. Um, the entire process essentially revolved around removing the turret. Um, I don't. They never used a ventral pack. Um, the bomb bay was basically just empty. I think they might have carried more fuel for range. Um, and they essentially tried to do everything they could to reduce uh, drag and get them some extra altitude. The problem is, is that it wasn't very successful. You have other designs that can do the same job at uh, at just a better capacity. For example, the Supermarine Spitfire, which is uh, obviously a well-known aircraft and a, and a well-performing aircraft, that one can accomplish the same amount of photo reconnaissance as the Blenheim. Um, it might have to use maybe a slightly smaller camera, maybe it doesn't have as much film, but ultimately you can you still have a, an easier time, so to speak, um, developing it that way. Now, um, when it comes to the, the PR model itself, um, there was a Mark II, but the Mark II basically just, um, they, they tried to add a little bit more fuel, see if they can get more range and a little bit more speed, but the result ended in just them giving up on the project. Um, the only other notable thing, which is very hard to see, and I, I don't know how many photos I've seen of the, the photo reconnaissance model specifically, there seems to have only been one airframe that was ever converted, um, but they shortened the wings but I can't really tell with any of the photos available. So um, if anything, take that with a grain of salt. Um, but uh, several books mention that being um, the change. Now, uh, when it comes to speaking about foreign service, um, or at least service outside of the UK, one of the biggest um, employers or, or users of the Blenheim happened to be the, Finla the Finnish. We can see that uh, even in 1937, they have access to the to the Bristol Blenheim through foreign uh, exports and, and so on. Um, and the only thing to really mention, just because the Blenheim was used to somewhat good effect, I haven't heard anything bad about Blenheims in, in Finnish service, um, but the only really notable point is uh, the two different types of skis. And this is... Uh, something we will likely see as we progress further and further into the podcast and we see other examples of uh, aircraft um, above the skies of Finland and uh, Russia or northwestern Russia anyways. 
Um, one is basically just streamlined to give it a better uh, aerodynamic performance, but I don't think that they ever really stuck around with that just because the um, the added weight, I believe, from the streamlined construction kind of just outweighed any gains. Um, the other thing, too, to keep in mind is that um, at a certain point, it becomes a lot easier to design skis that when the landing gear retracts, the skis essentially just fold up. So they still stick out and you still have your skis a little bit, but at the very least, they don't stick out as much as uh, the bigger stream, quote unquote, streamlined version. Now, after having talked about the Bristol Blenheim, uh, one also has to talk about the Bristol Bowling Broke. It's a very interesting dichotomy um, between two different designs that merged together uh, in uh, as design required um, and as uh, the war basically came to fruition. Now, the reason I say all this is because um, the Blenheim was good, yes, but the Air Ministry also required a uh, had a specification out because they required a reconnaissance slash light bomber aircraft, and um, the Bristol company essentially gave out uh, a design, which was a well as we can see it's very similar to the Blenheim. It's a little bit cleaner, has a has a couple changes, and the major one being the nose. It's impossible to uh, not differentiate a early Blenheim from a bowling broke of any type. And that sort of becomes the major um, difference between seeing a Blenheim ever. Um, and it kind of muddies the water a little bit on, on figuring out which is which. Um, and by that, I mean that I've very rarely seen a, um, a Blenheim that has the short stubby nose. You don't really see them too often, and the reason is because the extended nose became uh, a much more popular addition to the aircraft. So um, how it worked was the Air Ministry having their specification and Bristol winning that that um, that specification, namely G24-35. Uh, they called it the Type 149, and um, the biggest difference, aside from structural, uh, was a different set of engines. Now, the Air Ministry decided that changing production from the Bristol Blenheim, which is an all right design, I guess, uh, to the Bolingbroke would have taken too much effort. They can't rely on um, stopping production and then restarting it with a new design, even though the bowling broke and the Blenheim are very similar. So what they end up doing is they 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 say, um, we're going to build the bowling broke, but we'll build it in Canada. So um, I believe they send one airframe as a a uh, parent, and then uh, the the data along with it it gets shipped to Canada, and then they build it and they name it the bowling broke specifically. Um, the bowling broke essentially ends up being relegated to trainer duties because it's Canada. So if uh, as soon as any of the pilots go over to the UK, they'll likely just use UK uh, planes. So Hurricanes, Spitfires, Blenheims, etc. Um, so you see uh, a lot of um, like this livery specifically in the top left is a training livery. It it's all yellow, makes it very easy to see, uh, and so on. And um, essentially, the Canadian Blenheim, I guess we can call it, uh, uses a mixture of Canadian and U.S. instruments. Uh, another one of the biggest changes is that they tried to have a, um, they wanted to see how well a bowling broke could perform as a seaplane. And so they converted one of the airframes into having uh, two Edo floats. Edo being Edo floats being uh, rather popular um, at the time, and we've already seen this uh, or talked about this with the um, the Helldiver. Um, 
so the uh, bowling broke gets two variants. Um, the first one being the pattern, obviously. The second one basically is is a Mark One, but has American uh, instruments, or at least a mixture between Canadian and American instruments. Um, the Mark I only had a very small number ever produced, so the difference between a Mark I and a Mark II is, is kind of insignificant, really. Um, the Mark III is a seaplane, as we see. And then eventually uh, they come to um, the fourth designation. And by the time they hit the Bolingbroke Mark IV, they, the Air Ministry says, ah, oh, geez, the... The Bristol Blenheim is not really doing too well for us. Um, oops, uh, it's not doing too well for us. It's it's good. We still like it, but we're trying to transition into the next step of the Blenheim. Uh, this would later be the Bristol Beaufort, which would itself later become the Bristol Bowfighter. Um, but those are uh, sadly topics for another day. Um, the uh, essentially what happens is. The bowling broke gets a Mark IV, the and the Air Ministry says, you know what? It's about time that we merge the Type One Forty Nine with the with the Type One Forty Two, and because they're so similar in terms of of aircraft, um, this is seen as a, a very easy switchover. So you can see how it's kind of ironic that they don't want to obstruct from Blenheim production to eventually obstruct Blenheim production to add the, the changes that the bowling broke brought in. Um, essentially, the biggest change being the nose, um, as is the, the also the reason why um, you, you have to... There's only one difference in, in Blenheims, really. It's the nose um, between early and, and later models, anyways. Um, the other thing, too, is that uh, they noticed that there was a um, a rather large issue. The nose originally was more of a, um, a straight curve, but they because of all the glass they used, it turned out that it generated a lot of glare to the pilot, which is obviously bad. So what they eventually did is they kind of just gave a, a scoop out. So it really gets this curve so that the pilot is able to see without as much, uh, without nearly as much glare, anyways, um, to uh, to see over the nose. Now, another of the major issues or major changes uh, between the designs is that they still wanted to keep the um, the dorsal turret, and the dorsal turret eventually gets an upgrade to having uh, two machine guns. Um, the it wasn't mentioned uh, specifically by me earlier, but uh, another thing to keep in mind is that. The um, the Bristol turret that they used could be lowered and raised um, by the gunner at any time. Uh, another major problem, though, with um, with the Blenheim design as a whole, uh, is that the the turret could not work at the same time as the landing gear or the flaps. Now I'm pretty sure that the that the landing gear is not really a primary concern if you're under attack by a 109 uh, or other aircraft. The flaps maybe not so much. Yeah, but, you might want those for evasive maneuvers. Yeah, so it always struck me as weird. Now, um, in manuals for the aircraft, there is um, there is some conversation about uh, the hydraulic system using three settings. So one is uh, flaps and landing gear. The second one is neutral, and the third one is turret, I believe. Um, I might be mistaken on neutral. That might be off. I don't think that's the case, though. But anyways, um, basically shows how, like, there's there seems to be, in my opinion, something wrong with the design if you can't operate a turret at the same time as, at the very least, flaps seems um, uh, important to me. Um, and we can also see that um, the merger of the design, basically, we also kind of see the uh, the curve here um, given by the uh, the nose and how it's kind of misshapen. Um, we can see the difference between the two cockpits. Um, the bowling bo broke basically remains as like a, it still uses um, 
American and Canadian instrumentation at the same time. Uh, there's a little bit of added instrumentation on the Bolingbroke cockpit, but for all intents and purposes, uh, the two remain uh, essentially the same. Um, there are a few modifications to the Bolingbroke uh, Mark IV in terms of uh, side variants. Um, namely, there was a uh, Mark IV C, which had Wright Cyclone engines instead of the um, Bristol Mer Mercury engines. Um, and they also had a Mark IV W, which used uh, twin WASP engines instead of uh, Mercury engines. And this was purely because um, any aircraft that were used in uh, by the Americans or in the U.S., it was just simpler in terms of um, supply uh, demand to use one engine over the other. Um, now, speaking again of the retractable turret, um, we have a nice little image here that shows the inside. So if you're ever curious as to how turrets look um, as they are installed, look no further, as well as the notes uh, specifically from one of the manuals that state how uh, the turret cannot be in operation at the same time as the undercarriage and flaps. So a very important um, distinction there. Um, not to be deterred on uh, different turrets that the uh, that the Blenheim slash Bolingbroke ever used, um, there are a couple other differences that are funny and interesting. Um, the first interesting ones, obviously, will be uh, these three. So the original uh, dorsal turrets typically used a 303 machine gun. It varies between a Vickers K or a Lewis, but for all intents and purposes, um, they're equivalent. They're not the same, but close enough that it doesn't uh, it doesn't entirely matter um, uh, for for our purposes. Um, later on, they moved to twin Vickers K machine guns, and this is uh, accomplished one because you can't have Lewis guns. Um, the reason being the top fed magazine the drum magazine is just too big so you can't have two side by side um, and they decided that they needed more uh, defensive firepower to protect from uh, anybody that's going to harass them blenheims were still used um, for at least the better part of the first half of of world war ii um, and despite being poor in terms of daytime bombing or daytime fighter uh, duties, they were still used in long range patrols and, and um, anti-shipping maneuvers. So they still needed something to protect themselves. Um, as the availability of uh, twin 303 Browning machine guns, technically this should actually not be 303, this should be 30 cal. Um, but as the Americans draw into the war and the those machine guns become more and more readily available, um, some of the uh, Blenheims turn to using those uh, in their turrets. Um, additionally, there was always a very common problem with bombers uh, in various nations' air forces. Um, that being, how do you defend yourself uh, effectively against enemy aircraft? Um, you have problems such as um, one of the major considerations that you need to make when you're designing a bomber is what is the coverage of your defensive guns? Um, we can see here that there's a, a rather large cutout uh, on the side of, of the turret. This is um, due in part to allowing a steeper angle to shoot downwards. Now you can only go oh so steep just by looking at the guns and, and how large they are and how much space there is in the turret. But if you cut away the side, you do offer a couple more degrees of angle in order to shoot downwards, which becomes important if that, you know, if an enemy fighter finds himself in that spot. When it comes to the Blenheim, you have one forward firing gun in the port wing, and you have a single or twin machine gun turret in a uh, the dorsal position or on the back of the aircraft. So you can only get so much firepower out of that. So ways to get around this problem were to try and install a tail a tail gun. Now the problem with some of these installations, as you might imagine, are that they're rather limited on what they can cover. 
uh, rear firing engine nacelle mount is cool, but if we look at your uh, photo of the, the Blenheim, it can only shoot in a straight line from that engine. There's no aiming device. There's Even if there was, you can't really expect uh, a single 303 machine gun to really be able to do all that much. And who's going to control that gun? If it's the pilot, yeah, they're not really doing um, all that much in, in terms of uh, effective firepower. The visibility backwards would suck. I think the best thing you can do is go, oh, goodness, there's somebody on my tail. Quickly, let me dispense some tracers to think that something far scarier than what's actually going on is happening. Yeah, basically. it At most, it could be a, a warning measure or try to scare them. But the problem is, is that as soon as you use that machine gun, yes, for a fighter pilot, it might be scary to now have um, machine gun fire from a position you weren't expecting. But you can quickly get around that. Um, one of the major problems with the Blenheim, as with a lot of uh, British bomber designs, is they didn't have ventral gun points. So, yeah, just dive under the aircraft. You're fine. If you need to... If you need to wait a couple of minutes to regain your senses, you can do that without ever being in danger from uh, a Blenheim. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that would do is discourage somebody who's directly on the Blenheim's tail and trying for a zero deflection shot from a tail chase, which, hmm. I mean, is understandable because that is the best aspect to shoot some a bomber from in a hmm. lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But... Still, it's just it's, so limited. Yeah, it's and the other thing too is that even on a um, that's kind of why the tail gun, as silly as it is, was seen as viable because if your fighter pilot decides that a zero deflection shot straight on the six o'clock of an aircraft, if he's slightly lower than the tail, well, your your gunner can't see through this tail, so having the machine gun here allows a little bit of extra coverage. It's the same thing with uh, with the nose gun. And it's the same reason why you see nose guns that were added uh, on other, on American bombers, uh, like the B-17, um, I think the B-24 as well, where they didn't initially have guns there, but it what it did is it incentivized enemy fighter aircraft to attack from the nose. And so having machine guns there was seen as a necessity in order to prevent such such things from happening. Yeah, the B-17G is when they had a basic, basically they had a running problem because there's a dorsal, a ventral, a tail, two side turrets, so on and so forth, and the Germans were like, okay, mm -hmm. does the nose have guns on it? Sure, the closing speed is hellish, but, you know, we're shooting into the nose of the plane, which is like navigator, bombardier, pilot, co-pilot, all stacked up right in there. Every shot's going to do hideous damage to important crew. Mm. And there's no guns, so they just go on and make their head on, on passes. And I mean, going back to the interception thing, they probably don't catch up back up with the bomber stream again, mind, mm -hmm. after taking this pass. But if they get their hits, it's absolutely devastating. So... They end up uh, stealing the chin turret for the B-17G off the uh, YB-40, which was a program to make an escort version of the B-17. Mm -hmm. It was just absolutely studded with machine guns. So they took that two-gun turret. They also took uh, two cheek guns for the other people in the uh, nose to shoot mm. you know, on angles and to try and ward it off because that was the preferred Luftwaffe uh, attack for a while. And also, because the closing speed is absolutely insane, all the other bombers in the formation would have a reasonably hard time assisting because they'd be looping shots out in front on an angle and the closing speed would be hellish and the collection would be nasty. Yeah. So to alleviate um, the problem of not having a gun that can really cover the underside or at least provide extra coverage in the rear of the aircraft, they come up with two solutions, one after the other, obviously, but both essentially providing a little bit of the same. Now, the first is the Fraser Nash FN-54 early type pattern, um, which is differentiated in having a nice little bulbous 
um, design, it's all perspex, so you should be able to technically see uh, the machine gun, and it covers the area directly behind and below the Blenheim. Um, the second model, he, as seen on the right, is a twin machine gun. Um, it's the same sort of, I, th I think these should still be 30 cals, but anyways, um, it's the same sort of, um, uh, not design, but it's the same sort of objective that they want to achieve, um, but you get a little bit more firepower and um, it's a little bit more rugged. You don't have to worry as much um, in, in terms of uh, how it might affect uh, plane performance. It doesn't stick out as much and so on. Now, the interesting thing, and I only found these actually today, uh, I'd never seen um, the actual design of the Fraser Nash turret. It's it's very hard to find these photos. Um, these were like basically in comment sections of forums and in the deep dark web. Um, so very, very nice that you, I can finally find these. Um, essentially how both worked is they, they both operate on telescopes. So uh, the early design kind of is, you know, you they gave way to that for the better design with a better periscopic scope, um, with a better seating arrangement, um, and uh, as well as having um, just a better way to get out of uh, the plane. I say that because um, one of the emergency procedures, as mentioned in uh, the manuals for the Blenheim 4 and later variants, um, or at least I, I think all my... Yeah, I do have a Mark V manual. Anyways, um, is essentially you uh, you disconnect the the seat and control handles. Um, there's a locking handle here, which I believe is the locking handle to keep it attached to the nose of the plane. Um, if you're going down, you you uh, remove the seat, remove the control handles. You pull on the locking handle, it falls away, and then you just jump out. Um, but nonetheless, very interesting. And if you ever see um, the uh, the twin gun, uh, it's it's very. Um, if you play it in video games, it's funny because the you never treat the Blenheim as a sort of uh, as a danger to you if you're behind and below. Um, but as soon as the Mark IVs come into play in that twin turret, um, it it throws you for a loop. Uh, the other thing too is that the while it doesn't look like it's capable of it. Um, the the late turret was able to move, I believe, 20 degrees on each side, and the vertical is like 15 to 35 degrees. So it doesn't cover a huge amount of space, but enough uh, to be deemed valuable um, to add to the, uh, the overall design. Um, this leads us to the Mark V, sometimes called Bisley. Um, and the Bisley seems to only be uh, applicable to the hard nose variant. Um, I'm not entirely sure what uh, any other major differences might be uh, for the Mark V offhand. Um, the way that it's presented to me, or that I, I've read it, is that the Bisley seems to have been a one-off. Um, they wanted to have a ground attack aircraft. Why they would ever choose the Blenheim is beyond my capacity to, to ascertain or, or to understand. However, that is what they wanted. And in order to achieve a sort of ground attack variant, um, they did what most people do to bombers selected for the, or aircraft selected for that purpose, namely um, up armor it, um, give it the solid nose cone as we see here. Um, the, that should be an E. Now I'm just pointing stuff out that wrong. Yeah. Anyways, uh, apologies. Um, so the solid nose. Um, some I've seen statements that it's actually five machine guns, so not specifically four, unless they mean four in the specific quadrant. Um, and that includes as well the uh, the port side machine gun. Um, and it's it never went anywhere. The Bisley was kind of a what if and then quickly dumped uh, so that they could keep um, the um, the regular nosed version. Now, the Blenheim Mark V is kind of... Um, oh, ascent one note. Uh, Bisley is where the British National Shooting Center is. Right. So. Yeah. So that's where it, it earned its, uh, its name. 
makes sense for a story for knows. <laughs> um, but yeah, like the only basically the the last major variant of the Blenheim, the Mark V, is more uh, exists more because it needs to do long range patrol and anti shipping uh, or or shipping escort duties um, in the Atlantic. They're not really used um for purposes in europe to um to bomb german positions or bomb german towns it just doesn't at that point it does not carry a, uh, enough bomb load comparative to just about anything else even mosquitoes and and bow fighters can carry the same if not more of a payload and so there's no reason to really use it for those duties anymore um we can also see here just a, a couple of the differences and, and just the side profile um, of the uh, the Mark V and what the solid nose looked like. They're essentially the same. Um, the uh, the Fraser Nash turret still exists, but has a different fairing, which is, I I guess, just to uh, improve airflow. But I can't really see it uh, having that much of an effect. Um, you also see that uh, yes, these were indeed used by uh, by Turkey, um, who were given, I believe, thirty seven or so um, by uh, by the United Kingdom. Uh, probably more specifically, sold to them. But um, regardless, uh, it it was not uncommon. Which is there? Uh, it was not uncommon to see uh, Blenheims in the hands of allies or supporters of uh, against uh, the uh, Axis powers. Uh, lastly, we have another profile view just to give you an idea as to each and every uh, different uh, Blenheim and Bolingbroke. Um, one, uh, one type I forgot to mention being the Mark IV-F. Um, this is sometimes more called the Bolingbroke Mark IV-F and uh, much like the uh, the Blenheim, the Mark IV tried to be the next um, iteration of the fighter slash night fighter of the Blenheim. Um, there's only one major difference, I, I would say, between the two, other than the ones already spoken about. Uh, namely, the engines are a little bit different, the, the nose is a little bit different. But the major thing is that the gun pack used is actually slightly deeper and when they say deeper they just mean the height of it and this is so that they can get around uh the nose if the pack was the same height it it would be uh it would hit the bottom of the nose and obviously that's a bad thing but uh essentially that ends the the mark V is the end of the the blenheim lineage um there's nothing else uh, for it and the design sort of goes away. Nobody ever talks about the Mark V, as far as I know. Um, photos of it seem to be uh, pretty scarce. Um, interestingly, we can see that there are some, um, there's like a little bit of a sawtooth action here. Um, that's basically the exhaust pipes. So we can see the exhaust pipes um, on the engines over here. And these are typically, these should be dampeners. So how it works is it basically, um, it reduces the flame effect that you would get out of uh, exhaust pipes from engines to make it harder to see. Um, the only other thing that this could be used for, um, if the design is different, it would be to increase the number of exhaust pipes, which would theoretically, sometimes it doesn't really give you all that much, but theoretically gives you uh, additional um, speed because you have more exhaust coming being pumped out of the engine, which propels you like a couple kilometers faster per hour. But uh, with all that said and done, that is the end of the episode. So uh, as always, thank you for, for coming by. Thank you for listening. Um, we've got a Patreon, we've got a Twitter. I forgot to put those in the last slide. So thank you, me. Um, uh, on Twitter, it's uh, twitter.com slash fancy podcast. Uh, and on Patreon, uh, we're on there. So just look for us via the title. Um, anything you wanted to add, Mr. X? Uh, no, nothing particular. All right, cool. Um, one last thing, and that is to mention the um, 
the next aircraft that we're going to be talking about. Um, I'm not going to put up an, an image because I think it's striking enough that it should just uh, speak to its own merits. But the next episode will be about the French Breguet 270 or 270. Um, I think technically it could also be called the 27 or 27. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. It's a very funky aircraft. Um, doesn't get any love. So uh, look forward to it. So until then, uh, thanks for watching and take care.